Russia welcomed the new year by firing rockets and drones into Ukraine and by beating revelers on Red Square at home. It seems like Russia never changes. But will a crushing defeat of its forces in 2023 finally bring home to Russians the folly of their full-scale war against their peaceful neighbour? Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe to help more people discover the amazing guests on the channel. Today, I'm speaking with Ryan Macbeth, influential YouTuber, author, triathlete, army veteran, and programmer. Ryan makes educational and OSINT videos that look at the war in Ukraine from a military perspective. Today, we'll be talking about the two sides strategies in the war, their tactics, their equipment, morale, training, and of course, the errors that have forced Russia to retreat time and again through the last year. Ryan, welcome, welcome to the channel. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this. Well, this is brilliant. I'm really looking forward to kind of unpacking your knowledge about the military aspect of the conflict. Uh, we tend to focus on a lot of speculation around sort of politics. And I think at this point, it's anyone's guess as to what's going to happen. Um, but let's have a bit of a review of the year. It has been a humiliating 12 months for Russia, hasn't it? It, it certainly hasn't gone as Russia had intended. I believe that Russia thought this was going to be a, a simple three-day war, maybe a 10-day war at the most. Uh, they supplied their soldiers for a three-day war, and they ran straight into the Javelin anti-tank missile, and that caused a lot of problems. This is around Kiev especially, wasn't it, where you had that <clears throat> massive column of armor, which... You know, there were there were politicians in Kiev who who really thought the game was up. You know, they didn't flee, but no one knew which way it was going to go. Um, yeah. In hindsight, of course, that seems to have been a shockingly bad strategy to pile all your armor up in a huge convoy, almost like a sitting duck. I mean, why did the Russians do that? And is that a normal tactic? So I actually spent uh, some time as a soldier in Germany as part of a group called uh, the Opfor or the Opposing Force. We also called ourselves the, the Krasnovian Army or Krasnovian Liberation Army, depending on what scenario we were running. Essentially, we were the bad guys that fought against NATO. And the normal Russian tactic is to probe, probe, probe and find a weak spot and then just send an armored fist through that weak spot. <clears throat> now, Russia's kind of interesting because I actually don't think their army is bad. They're just untrained. And so Russia didn't invest time and effort into training. And it's training that really wins wars. Not necessarily equipment, but training. And so Russia took their old Soviet era equipment and they piled it into this armored fist and they sent it essentially down one road. And they ran straight into the Javelin anti-tank missile, which is something they had never experienced before. Now, Russia knew about the Javelin. They, they were familiar with the Javelin. It's been in the Army's inventory since the 1990s, the late 1990s. But what it's like to get punched in the face until somebody punches you in the face and this was a big punch in the face it was a huge wake-up call because that area wasn't necessarily conducive to armored warfare people could hide in buildings and fire javelins out 1300 1800 meters and take out tanks and you take out the lead tank you take out the trail tank and you can deal with the rest at their leisure and that's just not something Russia has ever had to deal with before. And I think that was a huge, huge miscalculation on their part. And of course, the road, OK, it's a sort of dual carriageway, but it's it's not a huge road for that much arm to go down. And in that part of Ukraine, there's a lot of tree cover, isn't there? So Ukrainians were able to to hide and, and be quite mobile behind the scenes, whereas the Russians were very static and fixed on that highway. That's correct. And that's also where the N-Law shined as well. The Russians were familiar with weapons like the N-Law, but this was the N-Law's debut. And you saw how devastating this weapon could be, especially in built-up areas. The N-Law was just tearing units apart because this can be it's fairly lightweight, it's man-portable, and it has this special, not corrective guidance, but suggestive guidance to the user. So the user has a greater chance of a first-round kill. That's nothing that really any army has had to deal with before. 
And Russians might have expected uh, some kind of land superiority. And we'll come to the sort of ratio of uh, equipment like our artillery pieces in a minute. But Russia would have also expected to have naval and air superiority. And in fact, I think, you know, NATO almost certainly assumed that they would be dominating those spheres of the conflict. But actually, Ukraine, with a variety of Western weaponry, seems to have turned the tables um, in both of those other spheres of conflict, too. It, it certainly seems like it. I can't speak that well to the naval aspect, although Ukraine has shown a lot of innovation when it comes to their, their drone ships. But the air aspect, one thing people, a lot of people don't seem to understand is that air combat is hard. And one of the difficult things to do is something called deconfliction. And deconfliction is done by uh, airmen, officers sitting in a bunker saying, okay, we're going to send these planes over here. We're going to send these planes over here. And unless you do it frequently, it's very, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do, even if you do it frequently. It's something NATO does all the time, and people still screw it up. Now, I think one of the reasons you really didn't see the Russian Air Force is that Russia was definitely afraid of friendly fire, of taking down their own planes. Because Russian planes and Ukrainian planes are both Soviet-era aircraft. And so Russia... They had to be very careful with deconfliction. Add into that their surface to air missile systems. Because their surface to air missile systems are also used by Ukraine, at least the S 300 missiles, and I believe the Buck book system as well. So now you're not only worried about deconfliction, where planes need to go at any given time. Now you're also worried about air defense missiles because your air defense missiles look a lot like the adversary's air defense missiles. It is a recipe for disaster. And I think that's one of the reasons why you really haven't seen a lot of, uh, outside the first couple of days of the war, you haven't seen a lot of Russian airstrikes on Ukrainian positions. Russia, I think they are afraid of losing aircraft to friendly fire because deconfliction is hard. And of course, you know, some of the images we've seen have been reminiscent of the London Blitz. And certainly many Ukrainians, I think, mm -hmm. feel an affinity with the UK because of that history. Um, but if you look at that history, look if you look at what happened to London, and you had acres and acres of the city nightly being raised by carpet bombing. Um, I'm in no sense uh, any kind of military expert, but could we have expected some kind of... Uh, terror tactic like carpet bombing for Russia? Or or is that really a Second World War tactic? Is that redundant in a, the age of missiles? That's that's a good question. And I, I think that the reason, the reason carpet bombing was used was that it was the only way to get bombs on target. Dropping a bomb is hard. You're 30,000 feet up in the air and you're moving and you're trying to take something from your plane and hit a single spot on the ground that's 30,000 feet below. And you're also dealing with wind blowing back and forth and, and the bad guys get a vote. So the bad guys have anti-aircraft defenses shooting at you. They might light like smoke pots to obscure the target. The, you might have cloud cover. So back during World War II, we, they had to do carpet bombing because it was the you might have to drop hundreds of bombs just to hit a single factory. I think today with smart weapons, you don't have to expend so much ordnance to hit a single, a single uh, target. And also, every time you fly an aircraft, you're risking that aircraft, you're risking that pilot, you uh you're risking not risking you're you're creating maintenance wear on that aircraft and there's also a finite amount of ordnance so back in world war ii we were pumping out bombs and shells constantly so that wasn't that much of an issue they're also creating new aircraft i think we're entering an era of warfare where like donald rumsfeld said during uh during the Operation uh, Iraqi Freedom, you go to war with the army you have, not the army you want or wish you had. So Russia had to go to war with the air force that they had, knowing that there are not going to be any new bombers, there's not going to be any new fighters, maybe a couple new fighters. And 
ordinance, there might be some new ordinance, but it might be difficult to develop smart ordinance, especially with chip bans and so on. So I don't really see any kind of carpet bombing as a as a useful tactic because you're putting a lot of planes at risk for something that can be done by a missile today. And of course, I think what Russia has actually done in cities like Mariupol kind of answers that question as well, doesn't it? Because they've effectively raised that city to the ground. I mean, it resembles uh, cities that you see from the First World War with literally, you know, um, shell holes everywhere, even the trees blasted to, to sort of ruins and, and, and all the buildings. You know, 98% of the buildings damaged in Mariupol. So they've kind of achieved that aim um, through artillery, through massed artillery, as opposed to needing to do it by air power, I guess. Well, that was a playbook out of Chechnya. Uh, when uh, Russia decided to invade Chechnya uh, during the first battle of Grozny, they just, <laughs> they literally went, block after their first uh, foray into the city failed, they just went block by block, just destroying each block through artillery. It was just the easiest way to do it. And I actually wrote a paper on that. It's available on my website. When I, back when I was in the military, I wrote a paper on the Battle of Grozny. Um, but that that's kind of... One of the reasons you see Russia use artillery a lot is that even in the Russian Federation, they, they've tried to become more professional as time has gone on. But it's they kind of push their professionalism to their officers. Russia does have an NCO court. They do have non-commissioned officers. Non-commissioned officers are usually junior sergeants. They've been trying to get mid-level sergeants, um, but that really hasn't happened yet, uh, mainly because in Russia, if you want to uh, lead troops, you become an officer. If you want to proceed on a technical career path, you become a warrant officer. So there's really none of those mid-level NCOs that can provide leadership to troops. But they can take officers who are skillful and put them in artillery units. And now you have an officer doing the thinking, and the men are just loading and firing the guns where the officer tells you. So if you're trying to do an army on the cheap and not have a dedicated NCO corps that can make decisions on the ground, it's a lot easier to have an artillery focused army where you put the smart officers in the back calculating where they should fire shells. So that's kind of why Russia goes the artillery path because going the path of the light infantry path, which Russia doesn't even have light infantry, even their airborne is mechanized. Because every time you have light infantry, now you have to have young men who have to make decisions. And that is not really something Russia is comfortable with, young men making independent decisions. It goes, I think, against the uh, entire political structure, doesn't it? And this is something which uh, Ben Hodges talked about. He talked about the exact point in the NCO class. But also Ukrainians have, have talked about this because, of course, the Ukrainian army has its origins in the Soviet army. And, and many um, veterans would have fought alongside Russians in Afghanistan. And, and for them, this must make it especially uh, painful what's happening. Um but Ukraine has developed this sort of NCO cast, this this level of um, thinking people who can think independently, who can perhaps have some independence in the battlefield. And I've heard Ukrainian um, organizational capability compared to a sort of horizontal strategy, which is much closer to the one, let's say, NATO would adopt. Russia is still clings to this power vertical. I, I would say that's probably accurate. The one of the things, well, I guess two things are are, are uh, in Ukraine's favor here. Uh, one of them is the American National Guard, uh, I believe the California National Guard and the Florida National Guard spent a lot of time in Ukraine training the Ukrainians, uh, sometime on the javelin and sometime with with um, with uh, infantry tactics. And the other thing was that this war that was being fought in the Donbas, this low level insurgency. That actually was creating an NCO Corps. It was creating soldiers who essentially joined their National Guard or Territorial Army and would fight for three months and go home for three months, and fight for three months and go home for three months. So they're getting that experience, they're getting that knowledge. Um, and when the war kicked off, you had all these guys who had been reservists and they just 
So they, they just showed up at their unit or their closest unit. And were like, hey, what do you want me to do? <laughs> you had this instant army of people who were experienced. And it's that experience and training that wins wars. And isn't it bizarre? You know, this has gone on for eight years. And uh, there's a, a, a sort of propagandist phrase that people in Russia bandy around. You know, where have you been for the last eight years? You know, they talk about it as if it's, it's, you know, some great patriotic struggle. But what they fail to realize is that by attacking Ukraine for eight years continuously, not only have they made Ukrainian society more resilient, they've forced Ukrainians to band together and, you know, not fight each other in order to survive. Um, but what they've also done is created an incredibly resilient army because, of course, the Ukrainian army in 2022 is nothing like the slightly sort of disorganized uh, army that you saw in 2014 that wasn't at all ready to counter the little green men, wasn't at all ready to push back and uh, retain Crimea or even the Donbass. Um, it, there's been this transformation in Ukrainian society and military, almost courtesy of Russia. So how did they not no. realize that in 2022? <sighs> I, I don't know. Um, actually, one of the biggest things that Ukraine did was uh, they got rid of their the practice of the Dovchina, the rule of the grandfathers. <clears throat> and, you know, not all of your viewers might know this, but uh, in Russia, when during conscription, uh, and Russia has tried to get rid of this and stamp it out, and they still haven't been successful. But essentially, the when someone is conscripted, they're, they were at least conscripted for two years. And the second year soldiers haze the first year soldiers. And we're not talking about the kind of hazing that you might do in the American army. Like, hey, go find me a box of grid squares or bang on the tank and find for weak points, right? That, no, we're talking about bad, bad stuff. And I'm not gonna talk about because you'll get demonetized on YouTube. Just stealing money from soldiers. And that's just the least of it. Stealing food, that's another thing. Ukraine successfully rid themselves of the Dovchina, which I think made their army a lot stronger because that element of hazing was gone. So why didn't Russia notice? I I guess I guess a lot of times you tell yourself what you want to hear or you make the intelligence fit what you want to know. And there are people in the Donbass who saw Russia as liberators. They consider themselves ethnically Russian. They speak Russian. And there are people in the Donbass who want Russia to be there. And that that's a tough, that's a it, it's tough to close that loop, at least for a lot of Westerners, to, to think that there are people who want Russia to be there. Hmm. And many who so didn't back, back in, left. Back, yeah. yeah. I mean, many who didn't kind of fled, fled that territory. And I've now interviewed lots of Ukrainians from the Donbass area. And yeah. You know, those that understand how Russia operates and those who started to really get it, I mean, many of them left uh, if they could. So, uh, I mean, perhaps those that remain either either are subject to propaganda. We know that the first thing that Russia does in territories it wants to control, it just pumps them full of, uh, you know, propaganda, propaganda TV. They make yeah. sure there's no other alternative sources. Um <laughs> And that is, of course, going to be a challenge, I think. You know, I mean, I, we were talking about this before we uh, switched on the recording. You know, I, I have optimism that the whole of the Donbass will be retaken. I also have optimism that when that happens, there'll be many people who will actually greet the Ukrainian army like they did in Kherson, actually as liberators. I think people will be quite surprised because there's a, you know, there's this um, Russian propagandist myth that, that everyone there wanted to be liberated. I think, you know, even those that had some sympathy for Russian culture, you know, will probably say, well, we didn't need liberating. We weren't, we weren't exactly, um, yeah. you know, um, occupied. Um, I think it'll be interesting if that happens, but it, but of course it may not. Um, and at the moment that's sort of pure speculation. Now this channel started uh, in March in, in uh, reaction to the war. And of course, you know, when the war started, you also had a big pivot, didn't you, on your YouTube channel, and you started yeah, making I, these materials. How's that? What kind of a journey have you been on? Yeah, that's actually been pretty darn crazy. I, I, uh, I had a YouTube channel for about 18 months, mainly doing topics on uh, software development and cybersecurity. And uh, now I try to do at least one software or cybersecurity video a month because I, I like to do them. You know, I really enjoy doing them. 
Um, but uh, back when the war started, I did two videos. One was on why we hadn't seen any cyber attacks in Ukraine. Uh, and the other was on why Russian tank turrets pop off of their hulls. And that video made my channel explode. I got almost, I want to say 17 million views before that got demonetized by YouTube. And uh, that that kind of made me think like, wow, there's there's actually a, a market for this. And I, I think that, you know, when you watch the TV news, they only have 30 seconds or, or two minutes at the most on a topic because they got to cover a bunch of topics. And so they might tell you that there's a war going on in Ukraine. They might tell you they're using javelin missiles, but they might not tell you why a tank turret pops off its hull when it's hit. And so I think that's a niche that I can kind of um, that I can kind of fill. And the other thing is that, you know, at least in America, only one half of one percent of anybody has ever been in the military. So you have people who are particularly so anybody who hasn't been in the military, they are particularly susceptible to the kind of propaganda that Russia might put out to try to convince you that someone is committing a war crime or someone is doing something that's illegal. Uh, one of the things that I get all the time are that Ukraine is shelling Donbass, you know, just innocent. They're just firing shells into the city for the heck of it. And that probably happened during the war, during the civil war, before Russia invading. I could see National Guard units, Territorial Army units going, you know what? Screw that area. But now that Russia's invaded and Russia has counter-battery radar, every time you shoot a round, Russia knows where that round came from within five to seven minutes. So are you going to risk your <laughs> risk your unit, this valuable piece of equipment and these valuable shells, just for the heck of it? Ah, let's throw some shells into a civilian area. So a lot of civilians don't know about counter-battery radar. So I can take stuff like that and say like, hey, this is probably why this isn't happening because if this happens, then Russia's gonna know exactly where you're firing from and you have five to seven minutes to get the heck out of Dodge, right? So stuff like that, or even some stuff uh, like there was a, uh, a building that Russia said was hit with HIMARS and there were Ukrainian prisoners in there. And I I know a little bit about uh, creator analysis and I was able to say like, hey, this is why this didn't happen, because the building would have been blown. This first of all, high Mars, high Mars rocket, at least the M31s that Ukraine has, has a 200-pound warhead. I don't, I don't know what that is in kilograms. But um, that, <laughs> there would have been no freaking building. <laughs> you know, like, and so, like, looking at everything, you know, like, well, they probably shut the doors and dropped incendiaries inside. And Is it my political, cynical political radar would have said, of course, it was Russia that did it, not from the uh, the military point of view, but from the uh, uh, just, you know, understanding how the FSB uh, operates and the sheer brutality of it. And the fact that whenever there's a crime, whenever there's a hideous crime like uh, poisoning Skripal or Litvinenko or something, and everyone's like, did they do it? Did they not do it? It's like, of course they did it. You know, and this is a signal. This is a terror signal they're sending out to people. It's this is how they operate. I think that hasn't quite got through to people. But it's interesting you mentioned the sort of, um, you know, the barracks, because, of course, there has been a hit on a Russian barracks in uh, Medvedevka, yeah. I think it's called, um, literally yesterday. And there is some um, controversy, obviously, about the number killed. But even Russia has admitted that 63 were in there. Ukraine is claiming that it's that it's hundreds. And. That building, when you see the footage, that is absolutely obliterated. I mean, there isn't a yeah. single stone on top of another. That That is more reminiscent of a, of a HIMARS strike, is it? I, I would say so. Now, there was also an ammunition dump nearby, supposedly. I haven't gotten the satellite footage of it yet. Um, but, yeah, that um, I mean, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. Those kids had to die for nothing. But uh, Ukraine has taken these high Mars missiles. That that really has been a game changer because it's it's kept Russia on their toes. And actually, the the easy way to, you know, I, I often say OSINT is really just drawing circles, a lot of times. So the easy way to figure that out is find the impact area, and just draw a circle using Google uh, Earth around that impact area, and that 
specific um oh god i forgot the range of the uh m31 i think it's 50 ish miles again i don't know what that is in kilometers but you know if you uh you just draw a circle around that thing and that launcher was somewhere in that circle so that's that's an easy way to figure out whether it was a high mars attack or not and we've seen lots of footage of, of obviously the HIMARS firing and of course once they fire, as you say, they have to get out of that location so they're not hit. I hadn't realized that that applied to all artillery. So does everything have to be relatively mobile? Um, you know, can you move artillery units out of the way as well? I mean, how difficult is yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, mostly. That, a good artillery unit can stop, set up, shoot, and move fairly quickly. I, and and, and I, I don't want to get into the times because if I... If I give the exact times without looking them up, I'm going to be wrong. <laughs> People are going to call me out. I want to say within five to seven minutes to set up and within two to four minutes to scoop, you know, to get out of there. But it, it depends on the unit. It depends on how well trained they are. It depends on uh, how many guns they, they took down. Now, if they're in like a static defense and they know there's no counter battery radar around and they can chill out there for, for a while before they have to move, or if they're supporting an attack, uh, the good rule of thumb is that during an attack, your guns are one third of their distance to the front lines. And during the defense, you're two thirds of the distance away from your front lines. So that's that's kind of the rule of thumb with that. And you can kind of play with that to uh, make sure you don't get hit by uh, your adversary's artillery. And of course, at the start of the war, um, one of the big concerns was that uh, Russian artillery pieces, Russian equipment generally uh, outnumbered Ukrainians, and the estimates varied anything yeah. from you know one to ten to, uh, to 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 even sort of worse odds than that. But those odds have sort of shortened, and I'm kind of interested to to understand how. I mean, we know that the Russians banned a lot of equipment uh, outside of Kiev. Um, then also yeah. in the Kharkiv offensive, which took them by surprise, a huge amount of kit was abandoned. Kherson, perhaps slightly less, but still, you know, it seems that the Russian army have been the, the biggest uh, donors to the Ukrainian army. But of course, a lot of kit has come from the uh, the Americans, some from the British, not so many artillery pieces, but, but other equipment. Um, is the ratio still in Russia's favor or are the Ukrainians able to uh, deploy more accuracy and mobility, which means that those ratios are less important? The ratio is always going to be in Russia's favor. Their tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery guns number in the thousands. Thousands of these things are produced during the Cold War. Thousands. Um, and actually, I, I would plug a channel called Covert Cabal that has covered uh, how Russia has been taking older tanks and refurbishing them, or at least cannibalizing them for parts. And I will send you that link if you want to post that for your subscribers. Uh, the I don't see Ukraine, I don't think there is enough armor in the world to match what Russia made during the Cold War. I mean, in the entire world. I don't think there's enough tanks to actually match that. Now, whether all those tanks are in working order, you know, I, I, you don't know. You know, I would probably say maybe one third of their vehicles are in good condition, another third are in condition where they can be refurbished, and then maybe another third are just good for parts. It depends on how they were stored and all that. So, I, I, I can see Ukraine gaining an advantage over Russia by using their equipment more wisely because they don't really have a choice. They can't really throw equipment and soldiers at the problem. They have to be wise about how they're using that equipment. But I think that Russia is always going to have an advantage, at least in terms of raw equipment. And do they have an advantage in the kind of open source intelligence and also sort of satellite capability? Now, this is an area where you know, some of my guests have sort of hinted at it going on, but have, have not given any details for obvious reasons. But I believe yeah. Ukraine is getting a lot of electronic intelligence that, that perhaps helps to reset, uh, you know, that balance against Russia. It's almost certain that Ukraine is getting electronic intelligence from friendly nations. Uh, I know that Russia, and I'm, I'm going off of memory here, as I didn't think I'd be talking about this, I believe that Russia has five spy satellites, but all of them are over 15 years old. 
And I know they just launched an Iranian spy satellite as a contract with Iran. And they kind of not reneged on the deal, but changed the deal a little bit to use that Iranian spy satellite as their own intelligence asset, maybe as part of the payment. So I guess when they're done, then they'll give it back to Iran. So I, I think that Russia is using open source intelligence themselves as well. Uh, and you know, it, oh, I can say open source intelligence. So open source intelligence is really just using publicly available data in order to come to different conclusions. Like if you want to, if you want to know the size of the Russian army, you can go and ask the Russian army, or you can take a look at contracts that have been posted on the World Wide Web for boots or uniforms. So, you know, even Russia is a still a capitalist country, right? So if the Russian army needs a contract for boots, they're gonna put out a bid. Say, hey, who wants to bid for boots? So if someone says, if the Russian army says we need a, a contract for 2,000 boots, you can be pretty darn sure if each soldier needs, if each soldier needs two sets of boots, then that means they're gonna bring in 100,000 soldiers into their conscript class. So that's open source intelligence, right? If they put out an order for uh, 400,000 hats and each Russian gets two hats, you know, all right, they're getting 2,000 people in. So that, that's really open source intelligence. So Russia is definitely doing that. You know, they're, they're taking a look at American contracts that are being put out and they're saying like, oh, well, America's trying to increase artillery production of shells. You know, how many shells can they afford to give to Ukraine before they run out of shells themselves? So I think that's being done on both sides. It is. I saw, I think it was the BBC or someone did quite an interesting one of that where they saw the contracts uh, for welfare payments for, you know, families who'd lost uh, a family mm. member, you know, and it was in the budget documents for a particular obelisk. And so yeah. they were able to figure out how many people from that region uh, who are potentially going to get these kind of death payments. And then they were able yeah. to extrapolate, well, if you then look at other regions and we know roughly where troops are conscripted from, they're, you know, they're able to estimate things like Russian casualty rates from, from this kind of activity. Uh, uh, that's exactly down on what you uh, Now, it's a bit of a redundant question here. I was going to ask whether tank tanks are redundant, because I know every war... Um, you know, the demise of the tank is is predicted. Clearly that, you know, they're playing an important role in this war. So I'm going to pivot the question a little bit, uh, you know, based on what you said a moment ago. Where is the Armata T-14? Uh, why are there so few sort of T-90s? And why are they not performing, perhaps, in the way that has been predicted prior to this war? So the not many T-14 Armadas were produced. And... A lot of that on paper, the T-14 Armada looks like a good tank. It looks like a good tank. It has um, one of the major things that has an active protection system, which can shoot down anti-tank missiles in mid-flight. It's cruise protected inside of the hull. And the gun is an autoloader that ha has corrected some of the deficiencies of older Soviet era tanks. But Russia never got an overseas order for the T-14 Armada. And these days, weapons are so expensive that you need foreign orders in order to fulfill contracts. If you look at the F-35, that has, I want to say, off the top of my head, I might be wrong about this, 11 different nations, I mean, the UK, Australia, Japan, Italy, all of these nations are using the F-35. That helps bring the cost down. So if you have this advanced piece of equipment, but you don't get any orders for it, it it's really tough to produce on your own. Don't forget, Russia has an economy the size of New York State or maybe Texas. So if New York State had to field an army, an air force, a navy, a strategic rocket forces, a space program, and do everything else, they would be in a lot of trouble too. So there's there that's where the T-14 Armada is. The uh, the T nineties a T ninety is really a T seventy two. I know all the tank guys are going, well technically I mean it's it's really a T seventy two with some with some improvements made to it. Uh, I think the reason the T ninety T seventy two haven't been doing that well is training. It's training. If Russia had given their armored forces good training before this operation, I think you would have seen maybe not a major difference, but you would have seen more gains. 
Um, I think one, uh, one, one thing that kind of blew my mind was there was footage. And again, don't show this on your YouTube channel because YouTube will demonetize you if you show combat footage now. But there was a footage of uh, Russian tanks that were under artillery fire on a street and they weren't moving. They weren't moving. And any American or even British NCO would say, what the heck are you doing? Move, move, disperse your vehicles. And that, that goes back to training. So, you know, I, I, will, I will say, and I've said this before, the T-72 is not a bad tank. It's smaller than the M1 Abrams. Uh, it has, you can, you could actually consider the autoloader to be an advantage because the, in a nuclear environment, which was what the T-72 was designed for, you don't have a loader who's getting radiation every time he opens that breach and shoves in a shell. And back in the 70s, this was a great idea because, hey, you can take this thing and put it on a battlefield. And since you're just dealing with main guns, you have a smaller tank, it's harder to hit. Hey, one of the rules of the survivability on you, don't get hit. Don't be seen. Don't, don't be there. Don't be seen. Don't get hit. So you have a smaller tank, you have less of a chance of getting hit. So it was a good tank for the time period. And I guess the and mechanism. Yes, there was some training. It would. It, it might still be effective now. It's just. It's. It all goes back to training. I mean, that sounds like a complex mechanism. Again, that probably requires a certain amount of servicing, quite a high level of servicing the equipment. And I think that's an area where that will be interesting. Won't it? At the end of this war, when the historians kind of try to deconstruct where Russia went wrong and you know list the reasons, top reasons. I think. Things like nepotism and corruption are going to come near the top. But training, tactics, um, maintenance of vehicles and equipment, you know, corruption by swapping out decent parts for for sort of terrible parts like the sort of Japanese tire, uh, Jap rather, Ch Chinese rather, Chinese tires. tires yeah. That, yeah. Um, but again, you know, maintaining this complex equipment, probably people were scrimping on contracts, not doing what they should with that. Um, Putin on paper probably thought he had a pretty substantial army but what he's actually got in the field is is significantly less than what he was led to believe i would agree with that it it a lot of it goes back to training and training is expensive just a couple of months ago i was invited down to fort bragg north carolina to watch a paradrop watch um paratroopers jump from planes and i've, I've never been airborne so i didn't really know much about the airborne. I, I thought that maybe the 82nd Airborne did a jump once or twice a month. They were jumping every week, sometimes multiple times a week. And the drop that I watched was 700 some soldiers. That's literally a battalion and a half of soldiers plus a heavy drop of equipment. China, just a couple of years ago, did their first ever brigade level para drop. And so NATO countries are doing this stuff all the time. And some countries like China, and you would also extrapolate from that, Russia might only do an operation like this occasionally, or they can only do low-level operations, either because of funding or just lack of experience. I mean, Russia had its its annual uh, sort of war games on, on a massive scale. But again, you know, speaking to some people who sort of observed that in detail, they say that a lot of that is a little bit like a sort of Potemkin training. You know, lots of flashes, lots of grand set pieces, not necessarily, you know, individuals learning an awful lot about how to be, say, cohesive teams or how to, you know, work their equipment together. It's more about the sort of panorama that it creates for the guys, you know, the politicians sitting in the grandstands watching it. So one of the major advantages that uh, NATO has, or at least in the U.S. Army, I'm sure uh, the British Army uses this as well, is something called Miles Gear. And Miles Gear is essentially laser tag using blank ammunition. And Miles comes in various forms. You have tank Miles, you have uh, anti-armor Miles, you have rifles. You use the same rifle that you normally shoot, but you put a laser sensor on it that fires when you fire a blank piece of ammunition. You wear a harness and a halo on your head that'll detect these laser hits. When you're hit, an alarm goes off and you deactivate your weapon by taking a key out of it and you turn the thing off by turning the key. If you watch the movie Heartbreak Ridge, they actually show Miles gear in that. And as far as I know, Russia doesn't have anything like that. And one of the advantages of Miles gear is it allows you to do realistic force-on-force -force training. 
It allows you to actually put troops in the field and have them shoot weapons at each other in a realistic manner. Uh, and there's three training areas, the um, Fort Irwin, California, at JRTC at Fort Polk, and a place that I'm familiar with, Honesfeld CMTC in Germany, where you have dedicated op four units, dedicated bad guys that train all the time. And usually the op four rolls right over the blue four. But that's turned into a teaching moment. As far as I know, Russia doesn't have any kind of laser tag system. And so they have to do these staged exercises the way you've seen, because they can't really do force on force realistic training. And and this is a really fascinating point. Again, if we list why Russia is 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 really losing uh, and being pushed back and not able to retain territory. Training seems to be a critical advantage that Ukraine has, doesn't it? Because after 2014, um, NATO and the US especially got incredibly deeply involved in helping to train uh, Ukrainian forces. Um, and of course, since February this year, um, thousands of this, sorry, February last year, I've forgotten it's a new year. Um, Many, many thousands of Ukrainian troops have come to the UK to be trained by a sort of multinational uh, NATO task force. So how important do you think all of this training has been to revolutionize the Ukrainian uh, fighting force? I think the British training they're getting is probably some of the best in the world. I served with the British Army. I did some training with the British Army. They're, they're a good bunch of guys who know what they're doing. Uh, a highly professional NCO Corto. Um, I was amazed by their professionalism. And I also think that the, the SA-80 is a fine rifle. There's nothing wrong with that darn rifle. Uh, I, what the British are giving the Ukrainians is not only a safe place to train, but a safe place to train in a Western environment against things like pop-up targets or doing force-on-force -force exercises with miles gear laser tag gear that they might not have access to in ukraine and also it's a safe place to train you don't have to worry about getting blown up when you're in england and that that does seem to make uh, all the difference and of course for morale i mean you see the ukrainians whenever you see footage of them uh, i don't know if this is tightly controlled and I'll, I'll come to the kind of information war in a minute but their uniforms always seem to be very well presented, very well kept. They seem to be fairly, you know, modern uniforms, probably because yeah. a lot of the footage I've seen is not people actually at the front, but going yeah. going to the front. Um, in contrast, you know, the Russians seem to be relatively disorderly um, and their, their kit seems to be extremely poor. Um, and it's worn poorly as well. You know, they just seem sort of disheveled and disorganized. I mean, is that uh, part of the information war or do you think this reflects a kind of reality on the ground? So that, that's that's kind of a tough one because after a certain number of days, everybody kind of looks the same. Um, <clears throat> I've been to Israel and I've seen the Israeli army and any American soldier who would look at an Israeli would go like, oh my God, why are you dressed like that? But you can't say the Israelis can't fight, right? You know, the Israelis might not pay that much attention to how their uniform looks, but they always seem to be able to fight pretty well. Uh, Russia has a uniform called the Ratnik uniform. I, I think that you, you just you haven't seen that they didn't make enough of these things to go around for their uh, for their operation. I have seen on the Ukrainian side, it, it probably depends on whether their army or whether their national guard. Uh, a motley mix of uniforms. Uh, but one thing that I have seen is that what Ukraine tends to have are, are two very important things. The average Ukrainian soldier always has body armor. That isn't always the case with soldiers in the Russian army. Sometimes you see it, but not all the time. And the other thing is that a lot of them have what are called IFACs or improved first aid kits. Uh, which was, a, I want to say, an American innovation because this IFAC has a number of things in it from, from multiple countries. But a lot of these soldiers have IFACs. And an IFAC or an improved first aid kit is critical to making sure that wounded soldiers get the proper care they need at, at the point of you know when they're hit. So that those are two differences that I've seen. And whereas in the Russian army, you see people saying, "Hey, uh, bring first aid kits from home," and that that that's that's an issue. 
And that leads me on to the idea of the information war, because, you know, there's this whole um, morale booster behind the behind the lines. You've got NAFA, you've got all sorts of stuff going on. Uh, you've got Ukrainian memes. Whether yeah. these help at all on the front, I don't know. But when it comes to the proper sort of intelligence war, the Ukraine, Ukrainians seem to be a lot sharper. Now, when the war started in 2014, there were a huge number of paid informants, assets, Russian assets, spies, tame politicians, etc., throughout the Ukrainian establishment. I mean, that is uh, that is well known. I've uh, Some of my guests have sort of talked about that. And yet this year, they were able to pull off an extraordinary feint by con- you know, convincing the Russians they were going to go for Kherson in a big way, mm-hmm. and then they punched through in the north. That wouldn't have been possible eight years ago because that would have leaked out. Um, so what, what was your impression when you saw that happen? What needs to go on behind the scenes in order to, to keep that kind of information tight? That's 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 a good question. I, I honestly, I don't know if I can answer that question as to what keeps that information private because I never had to deal with that. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to, to discipline. Uh, the, the average soldier was disciplined enough not to talk to their families about what they were doing in that operation. And, and the other might be actually kind of keeping soldiers in the dark until they actually go and perform that. Like you might know, hey, we're training, but we don't know what exactly what we're training for. So you have two layers of security here. You have that operational security of soldiers knowing that they shouldn't tell people what's going on. And then if you do have any kind of element inside a unit that is uh say a double agent but is working for the russians they might not know that they're going to a certain location until it's too late so those are probably two factors that enter into the equation now before we get to the last question where i'm going to ask you the impossible thing of, of you know what your prediction for for the year is i've got one more area i wanted to get your impressions on of course and that is the extraordinary strikes behind Russian lines. We've seen, you know, many attacks on Belgorod, which is, you know, dozens of miles away from the front. But we've even seen extraordinary, um, uh, I'm going to say brave, because guys, they're probably remote attacks, and some people might be on the ground. But you've seen Engels Air Base, you've seen another a number of air bases, literally hundreds of miles inside Russia. Um, yeah. And extraordinary kind of rearguard action with warehouses, military installations, research centers, even conscription offices uh, being burnt down. And, and, and of course, at this point, we don't know what's behind all of these. I mean, whether it's drones or people on the ground, whether it's a mixture of Ukrainian special forces or, you know, Russian partisan units. But it's an extraordinary feature, isn't it, of the war, these uh, uh, incredible attacks. I, I agree. I Special forces angle, that's a tough one. I um, It's certainly possible because what's the difference between a Russian and a Ukrainian? They're both the same ethnicity, right? One can probably pass for the other, especially if someone grew up speaking Russian. So I think it's theoretically possible to have some kind of special forces unit in the vicinity of an airfield. Maybe I kind of air on the side of drone warfare or cruise missiles, um, mainly because that, that's just the most likely explanation. I and mean, the special forces angle, and that's certainly possible. Russian partisans, that that's possible. There is a movement within Russia um, for, in fact, they call it the Freedom for Russia Legion. Which there are some Russians who have left Russia and gone to fight for Ukraine. Not a lot. There's even some soldiers who have self-surrendered with their intention of joining the Freedom for Russia Legion. Uh, but I think for a lot of this stuff, I think you, you got to go back to drone warfare. Now, what you could have is you could have spotters on the ground. I believe that, that you might have civilian agents and spotters on the ground in Russia who are giving BDA or bomb damage assessment, or who are just counting planes. They're saying, hey, uh, five planes just left Ingalls. So if you know five planes just left Ingalls, you know within two hours they're going to launch their cruise missiles. You know within four hours the missiles are going to be striking Keith. So now you can do something like time when you're 
cruise missiles land so that way they they hit aircraft on the ground that i could see um but the uh this is probably happening in russia as well mm. or i'm sorry this is probably happening in ukraine as well you were you do have russian agents on the ground in ukraine who identify with russia who are giving intelligence information as troop movements or to aircraft uh, deployments I guess there's a slight advantage in there in that there are many more Ukrainians who can speak fluent uh, Russian. Uh, there are not not many Russians who speak uh, Ukrainian. I mean, uh, it was looked yeah. down upon, you know, it was seen as a provincial uh, sort of language in the Soviet Union. Um, so there's, there's definitely an advantage there. But also, you know, many millions of Russians have um, Ukrainian ancestry, uh, you know, as fairly recent as grandparents and great grandparents. So you know, under un, uh, underlying it, uh, there may well be uh, if people who are, are sympathetic. Um, well, let's come to the impossible question then. Uh, this is the new year. It's already yeah. seen missile attacks. It's seen an extraordinary attack by the Ukrainians on the so-called Mobiki or, uh, you know, mobilized forces. Um, and Putin, we know, um, doesn't de-escalate. He's never once de-escalated from a uh, tough situation in all 22 yeah. years he's been in power. Um, so what are your what are your predictions for the coming year? Uh, how long might this war last? And uh, there, 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 at this point, there are many potential outcomes. But what what was your feeling on where it's going? That 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 is a tough one. I've always avoided making predictions. <laughs> you know, at least at least long term predictions. Uh, I think the war will end when it ends. I think that. Um, I don't know when that's going to happen. I think that the ultimate end state will be a negotiated settlement with Ukraine negotiating from a position of power. Um, I don't see a surrender on an agreement. On, I don't see unconditional surrender being signed on a battleship. I don't see that happening. Uh, but I do see Russia ending this with an agreement with Ukraine that might see the Donbass region becoming some sort of quasi-independent state that's part of Ukraine, kind of like Kurdistan or the Kurdistan areas of Iraq, where Iraq really doesn't have control over that area and Kur the Kurdistan kind of runs itself. Uh, I also see a multinational force of UN observers or UN peacekeepers in the Donbass area, it's very similar to the MFO, the Multinational Force and Observers in Egypt, uh, that sit on the border in the Sinai Peninsula between Egypt and Israel, keeping the peace treaty, or K4 in Kosovo. I see something like that. I don't know if it's going to happen in, in 2023. Um, I also see Ukraine getting access to more and more Western weapons. I envision Ukraine perhaps getting the Bradley fighting vehicle, the infantry fighting vehicle sometime this year. My guess is that it will be Bradleys that were intended for Greece or Croatia, uh, which would be the uh, Bradley, M2A2 Bradley ODS. Um, since Greece and Croatia haven't taken delivery of those systems, those systems are probably refurbished, sitting in Europe and ready to go. They're just waiting on training. So I see that happening. And once they get the Bradley, I believe that Bradley is essentially going to be used as a mobile artillery spotter platform because the Bradley ODS has a laser sight. And with that laser sight and GPS, they can go up, oh, bad guys are over there calling their artillery and then commence an attack with their uh, 25 millimeter chain guns. So I, I envision that happening. I also envision maybe Ukraine getting Western aircraft. I can see that you know, when this war first started, one of the things I said was, I don't see Ukraine taking delivery of F-16s because it's going to take four years for Ukraine to get up to speed on maintenance. But it's been almost one year. And if we had started six months ago, it would be six months closer to getting this weapon system. So I, I can see Ukraine perhaps taking delivery or at least starting to train on F-16s that are in the U.S. inventory that have been mothballed. I see that as a possibility. So and does this I, also I, can get, I can do pretty okay on the technical aspect, the political aspect. No, no. I'm not a politician. I write software. I'm good with the technical <laughs> okay. side. 
Um, and what about, I mean, the big one, of course, as well is the Abrams and the Leopards. I mean, uh, Germany's been very reluctant to send heavy armor. It has sent some equipment, I mean, to give them their due. Um, they would have perhaps sent a bit more if uh, the ammunition hadn't been sort of frozen in uh, yeah. by Switzerland, which is an absolutely absurd uh, state of affairs. Um, but you don't think they're going to get tanks. And, and and does that matter, in fact? I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I want to start by saying nobody's ever going to buy a weapon system from Switzerland again. Um, if Switzerland can't be counted on as a reliable partner during a war, and if, if Switzerland's politics can um, affect the delivery of munitions, no one's ever going to buy a weapon system from Switzerland again. I don't think anyone's ever going to buy a weapon system from Russia again. You can imagine being uh, a, a, a president in a place, someplace in Africa, and a lot of your weapon systems are Russian era weapon systems. If you're an opposition leader, you can say, hey, the president doesn't care about our troops. Look at how those weapon systems are performing in Russia. Are you ever going to buy a Russian weapon system again if your opposition can say, hey, this guy doesn't care about our troops. Our troops deserve the best, right? Um, so there's, there's that. Regarding tanks, uh, the Leopard might be a better thing to send than the Abrams. And again, this, this goes back to a technical level. First is that the Abrams armor is classified. No one's getting an Abrams. <laughs> let, me, let me just lay that out for you there. No one's getting an Abrams. The other issue with the Abrams is that the Abrams has a turbine engine. And right now it's like the Bradley, it's a diesel engine. You can throw a any Ukrainian shade tree mechanic, any Ukrainian bubba, you know, or the Ukrainian equivalent of a redneck down south can take a look at a diesel engine and go, oh, that's just like my tractor. I can fix that. But the Abrams has a turbine engine that not only needs specialized mechanics, you need a specialized parts system to maintain this thing. So nobody's getting an Abrams. Probably a better way of doing it would be to buy T-72s from African countries or uh, Asian countries that are willing to sell these things and replace them with American or, or Western equipment. But... Again, tanks are expensive to produce. I, I, there's a, the Lima tank plant in Ohio. I don't even believe that's manufacturing tanks anymore. It's remanufacturing some tanks so just to, to create enough tanks to give to Ukraine. That, that's going to be a tough, that's a tough thing to do. Uh, I know Poland wants some more tanks. They, they bought the Leopard and for some reason they bought the uh, the Korean, uh, oh God, I, think, I forget the name. I think it's called the K2. They bought the Korean K2, an $8 million unit, which will probably go down. Because like I said, when you get a foreign contract, you can produce more. The numbers go down. So I don't know. Maybe sending K2s to Ukraine might not be a bad idea. But that that you know, That's a pretty advanced tank as well. So that uh, that may need some exploration there. But I, I'm not sure there are, there's enough manufacturing capacity to create new tanks to give to Ukraine in the first place. And like I said, nobody's getting an Abrams. The, the armor on that is classified and the um, the uh, the engine is just too difficult to fix without special training and a logistics channel. So you need, you need huge infrastructure to maintain it. You'd need a whole set of specialist engineers, you know, workshops, et cetera, uh, and, 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 and a supply line to sort of... Uh, does that Correct. also apply to um, you know anti-aircraft defense and a lot of the really advanced kind of weaponry that people have been sort of you know clamoring to get sent to Ukraine? And... Absolutely. The the Patriot missile system. I did a whole video on the Patriot missile system. The Patriot missile system is an incredibly advanced piece of machinery, and it requires some of the smartest people in the army are Patriot operators. These these people called uh, 14 Echoes. And it also requires these warrant officers, you two warrant, two different kinds of warrant officers in a Patriot battery, 140 alphas, 140 kilos. One does tactics, one does maintenance. And these people are literal rocket scientists. And so when, when it comes to delivering these Patriot units to Ukraine, I, I the only way I can see this happening is if we get contractors who were formerly 140 alphas, 140 kilos, and they they go over there as civilian contractors, you know, to help out with uh, the system because 
The Patriot is a very complex, highly advanced system. So they need that. They can probably train these guys to be uh, 14 Echoes. That's that's probably easy enough to do. Especially, they can probably reduce the time, especially if uh, these soldiers are coming from air defense background. But the system is still the system. You still have to learn the system. So, yeah, there's going to be a, there's gonna have to be a whole parts logistics supply chain. And don't forget, when you introduce one system, there's a finite amount of capacity to move things into Ukraine. So if you give them the Patriot system and the parts of the Patriot system, that means there's fewer trucks to carry other things. So what's the one thing these guys need the most? It's artillery shells. We can't make enough of them. Uh, a couple of um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, someone in Australia said that we should buy the B-21 Raider from the United States. Australia needs stealth bombers. It's like, you guys can't even make your own shells. I don't, I don't, Aust Australia, I believe, buys their shells from outside vendors. So how about we start with making your own artillery shells first, right? So for every truck that is carrying a, a Patriot missile, it's one less truck that can carry a bunch of artillery shells. So what, what's the bang for your buck here, right? It's easy to spend too. weapons. You know, how many of these batteries would you need? Because Ukraine is a massive country with dozens of cities. I mean, it would be... Very you would need a few to protect them. So a battery has uh well so a, a battalion of patriots should I'm trying to do the math the math here should have six to eight launchers per battery and there's four batteries in a patriot unit and they're all you know networked together so you would need a few and we're, I believe we're only sending, you know, one battalion of Patriots, which is what we have in storage that, that we can send. So you would need quite a few, but you would, it, it's, it's, I think the Patriot would be enough to protect key targets like Kiev, uh, maybe like Kyrgyzstan. And it, it's enough for the Russians to go, I don't want to tangle with that. So if, if you can kind of, if you can kind of, push these things out to a point where it dissuades Russia from, it creates a dilemma. I've always said, create dilemmas, not problems for your adversary. Adding this missile system in creates a dilemma because now you have a very capable, very effective missile system that can shoot down missiles. It can shoot down uh, warheads from theater ballistic missiles and it can shoot down aircraft. Now you're pushing your stuff back further. When you're pushing your stuff back further, that's increasing reaction time for Ukraine to react to these threats. So just by having the system there, you can create dilemmas for your adversary. And this whole war, I mean, to conclude here, this whole war has really given the, you know, it's undermined that propaganda lie that NATO was a threat to Russia, that NATO was capable or even intent on invading Russia. I mean, hasn't this shown that actually we have wound down our production of ammunition of artillery shells we've wound down the amount of units we've had we wound down the amount of active uh troops and systems in europe uh to the point where you know if russia was half competent and not riddled with corruption i mean they could have rolled over europe and and we'd wound down that capability to really defend fortunately for ukraine and for the west russia is riddled with nepotism corruption incompetence and as you say lack of training i i never thought i'd see the point where spain had more tanks than germany you know like i i never thought you know the the uh the german army was a, during at least during the cold war they were a good military and there were soldiers who wanted to be there and, and wanted to defend their country um i think that for the longest time europe got complacent because there, there wasn't really a threat and you had the United States as the big brother with the big stick who could kind of back you up. I believe during, um, oh, I forget the darn name of the operation in uh, in Serbia, uh, Southern Watch. I believe during, during Southern Watch, at one point, we were fairly close to running out of smart weapons in theater. And that was a big wake up call. And whoa, wait, hold on here. Like, we don't have enough of these weapons to actually prosecute a war if we ever had to. I mean, that, that was kind of a wake up call. But I, I do think, in a lot of ways, Europe kind of got complacent because they haven't had a war in 70, 80 some years, right? 
um, and countries that have maintained their uh, capabilities, uh, Great Britain, France, they're in a far better position to defend themselves than, you know, countries like Germany. I mean, heck, Poland. I think the only reason U.S. forces are in Poland is to prevent the Poles from going north and invading Russia. Like, they they have a, they, they have a, Poland has a very capable military, and their military is only growing, and they want to be there, and they want to fight. And they've got a bit of a beef with Russia, haven't they? Uh, yeah, historically. just a little. Just a little. I, um, yeah, that's, and I kind of say that in jest, but uh, you know, there's. I have a Discord channel. I have a number of uh, Polish uh, soldiers who are on my Discord channel, and a lot of these guys are also in their equivalent of a National Guard or Territorial Army, and th their reserves are, are growing as well. It's fashionable to be in the military now in Poland, and that's that's kind of an interesting juxtaposition with uh, with the way Europe is today. It's going to be an interesting world, isn't it? I mean, we've got Ukraine, which is going to be uh, like a fortress on the front line of European freedom, um, who are going to be, unlike the Germans, I think, and, and and partly the French, they're not going to be complacent for generations now. Mm -hmm. They're going to make sure they're armed to the teeth and able to defend themselves. Britain's kind of woken up again from, uh, I believe, from, you know, it was in the process of really winding its army down to the point where it would have been incapable of mounting operations. But I think that is all now going to stop. And uh, we're looking at a very different world, aren't we? I think so. I think so. Well, I think on that note, um, we're looking forward to positive news for Ukraine in 2023. But it's been a real pleasure unpacking your military brain and uh, getting some of those details, which you're right, we don't hear on the media, we don't hear in normal interviews. Um, it's really good to get those kind of insights. And I highly recommend people check out your channel. It's absolutely packed with incredible information, uh, like we've heard over the last hour. And um, I'm massively grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity.